All right. So, hey, uh, I'm Josh from Food First, uh, and I'm here with Katie German, who is uh, from Food Chair TO in Toronto. Um, and they have been a huge inspiration for us on all things equity and uh, around uh, more just HR practices. And we thought it would be fun to just have a little chat today um, and talk a little bit about uh, what Foodshare has been up to and how they inspired Food First uh, and maybe some, some lessons that uh, the folks can take from this. So Katie, I don't know, do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, Foodshare TO and particularly what you've been up to in the internal equity space? Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm happy to chat, chat, chat about this anytime, all the time. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I'm with Food Share Toronto. Uh, so we're a food justice organization working in Toronto. Um, and we are working towards a Toronto where everyone can feed themselves, their loved ones and their communities with dignity and joy. Um, that's kind of our updated mission in the most recent years. And a big part of that is um, looking not just externally at like program users or people who are, you know, customers or people who engage with our programs, are they food secure, but also asking questions about our staff um, and asking questions about internal dynamics. So I think for the for a very long time at Foodshare and also just across the sector, there are many people working in the nonprofit space who are themselves food insecure. And there are many people working in, you know, the doing the work of alleviating poverty, eliminating poverty, um, who are also living in poverty, um, because the sector sort of nonprofit and charity spaces has relied for a very long time on low wage and volunteer labor. Um, and for us, you know, no worker should live in poverty. <laughs> um, no person should live in poverty. And what were the ethics of us as an employer? Um, what were our obligations to ensure that we were not um, creating the conditions in which that was a reality for folks on our team? So that was kind of the like, we need to ask ourselves some tough questions. <laughs> um, and then also have sort of the the will and the courage um, to make some decisions as, a, as an organization um, and bring along sort of, you know, as everyone on the leadership team, the management team, the board, uh, donors, <laughs> all those people that might, might um, be concerned about big changes. Uh, how do you kind of manage that change? So do you want me to speak a little bit more about what kind of what those changes are? Sure, why not? I, I think sure. some of them we, we uh, very directly copied. So amazing. Were, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, tell us what, what you've been up to. That's great. So um, uh, a couple of things that we've done is that uh, we took a look at our pay grid. We have a standard pay grid at the organization. So everyone who's working in the same job gets the same pay. Um, they start at the same level on the pay band. Um, but what, so that's a, a positive thing to have, you know, the principle of equal pay for equal work. You don't have that at your organization. You should implement that at your organization. Um, but what we, we realized is there's a pretty big gap between uh, the lowest pay band and the highest pay band. And there was also many, many more workers working in the lower pay bands than in the higher pay bands, which, you know, that looks the same in most organizations across all sectors. Um, so one thing we did is we used a, a look at our, our pay grid and used a poverty reduction lens to say anyone who's working full time should be able to make enough to live in the city of Toronto, which for us is a higher living wage than, than in other locations across the country. Um, and we raised the, the lowest pay bands. Um, and so committed this year to being a, we did that a couple years ago, but this year committed to being a, a living wage employer, which in Toronto is actually $22 and eight cents an hour is what you need to be able to afford like a modest place to rent <laughs> um, and to just pay your bills and to get by. Um, and then we actually just increased it now. So our organizational minimum wage is $24 an hour. Um, nice. And that has made a huge difference. We're hearing from staff, um, like the impact that that has for people. We have people who've been working at Food Share for 10 years and they started at 14 and now they're at 24. Um, that's like a phenomenal <laughs> increase uh, for their life. And honestly too, their food security. And as a food security organization working on, you know, alleviating poverty, there is no way that we, <laughs> there's no way that we should um, be employing people who are food insecure. 
So uh, another piece that kind of went with the pay grid um, changes, we're implementing a ratio between the lowest pay band and the highest pay band. Um, so we've now tied those two together and a ratio of one to three, which means now if you want to raise the, the salaries of the highest pay band, you must also raise the lowest pay band. So what we're doing is eliminating that um, gap <laughs> and really honoring the fact that like in order for this, this highest position um, to have that salary, like it, we rely <laughs> quite heavily on the work that all the people are doing at all of the pay bands, and we can't devalue that work, um, mm -hmm. that that work is essential and important. Um, and it's not enough to say that some, that jobs are essential and thank you for your service, <laughs> um, but to actually pay people um, yeah. and money to be able to do that, yeah. Yeah, that's super cool to hear. And uh, a lot of that work was actually really the direct inspiration for some of the work that we've done. So we've actually, I think most of those steps also at Food First have happened in the last year or so. Uh, and I think it's obviously a little bit different. Um, uh, we're different scales of organizations. We're a much smaller shop than, than, than food share is. But um, I just wanna say like, from our perspective, it was really great to have uh, a lived example of those kind of shifts happening um, somewhere else that we could that we could see that it was possible. That's amazing. How did your um, how did your staff react to that? I think really well. So um, we went through this conversation in in the kind of depths of the pandemic. It actually cleared a little bit of space, and 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 I was new personally to the organization. So there was, I think, when you have a leadership changeover, there's often a moment when there's a real chance to rethink some of the the more fundamental parts of how an organization works. And there's been maybe conversations that have been kind of parked for a little while while you're waiting for the new CEO or ED to come in. So it was a good time for us. And um, I think, so we did, we brought in, uh, we have a living wage floor as well. Ours is pegged to the local living wage in St. John's. It's quite a bit lower, it's 1875 here. Um, but uh, we're pegged to that uh, so that when the living wage goes up, it's, it's in our policy that we just pegged to the calculation. Um, so it's, it's nice. We don't have to revisit it too much. Um, and then similarly, we run in the same ratio of, of one to three on our on pay bands and a, and a transparent pay band structure, which we hadn't had before. And so I think, uh, you know, everyone here, we generally know what the other, what all of us earn, or at least the, the rough, small range in a band. Right. Uh, and yeah, I think it has been super important particularly like this has been a, a really tough year for, for lots of people. It's been a huge strain on our team. And it was uh, a really big part of making people feel supported that, that like team well-being was so important this year. Like everything would have fallen apart uh, without it and, and people's lives were being pulled in so many different directions. And so I think it has really helped um, people feel like they have the, the backing uh, to, to deal with all the other things that are going on in their lives too. That's that's part of it. Um, and of course, yeah, like we would never want anyone on our team to to be food insecure, which is a real risk at those lower wage wage bands. I think like for us, it's been a bit different. Our our structure is probably a bit less of a pyramid than than a bigger organization like Future. So our bottom wage band for our kind of permanent employees was already well above that. Um, so where it's impacted us is around student placements primarily. So when we have funded placements here, we top them up to the living wage. And so it's just often, you know, uh, these are generally only funded at the local minimum wage, which is still not even $12 an hour. And so mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it, we've had to make some judicious choices. It costs us more to, to have student placements here. But on the other side, I think those folks feel more valued and, and like well, the type of work we get out of these people is, is worth way more than minimum wage, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's a similar situation here. So we um, are certified through the Ontario Living Wage Network and they do, um, through that one network, they allow a training wage. So if you had like a youth position or a student mm -hmm. position where, you know, you're really posting that job, um, because a student's going to be taking it, there's training involved. It's a little bit different than just like an open public uh, competition for a job. You can pay them a lower wage. You have to still do the minimum wage. But we decided as an organization to say that across the board, <laughs> whether it's a youth position, a training position, a student position, um, that they're going to pay that we're going to pay that living wage because 
someone in a training position doesn't get like a training rate on their rent. <laughs> they don't pay like the training rate for their food bills or their hydro bills. There's no difference in the cost of living if we're looking at the place where they live and the, and the context of where they live. Um, so we made that same decision that we weren't going to use like a youth wage or a, a training wage. Um, and I think that's something I would really like to see funders make a change. Like yeah, the federal probably. government, provincial governments, these types of organizations that offer wage subsidy programs um, need to understand <laughs> that the minimum wage is insufficient um, and that that higher wage point is a necessity for people to be able to live like and not just thrive but even just to live right so kudos to you for making that change and I hope to see other people do that <laughs> as well yeah I agree I think it's it's long past past time and, and yeah particularly I think we need to change our way that we think about what a quote unquote student position is, um, mm -hmm. because I think the, the kind of wording and the way that we talk about quote unquote student jobs is in this way that sort of positions them to be devalued. Yeah. Um, but that's not how it plays out. You know, that's not how the work is, right? That's not yeah. how these people are within the organization. Um, so, yeah, I think we'd echo that, that uh, it would certainly make our life easier uh, if more of these programs were able to compensate more from their side, um, because then we'd be able to, to take more people on and top them up to that level. But yeah, it's, yeah. And I, I, I think that's an important, important piece of it for sure. I'm curious, Katie, like, uh, was how, this is the other thing I think about this conversation is, um, or about doing this kind of things, so it feels kind of daunting going into mm -hmm. it. Uh, like how long did those transformations and those changes take in your shop? So we did an initial review of our pay grid um, where we lowered kind of the minimum pay band uh, three years ago, I want to say. That was when we did the initial like poverty reduction kind of lens to the mm -hmm. pay grid. So the lowest pay band went up 25%. The highest pay bands didn't move. And the pay bands in the middle went up somewhere between like 7% and 10%. Um, so that was like the initial step. What, so it does, I don't know, it's interesting. Some of these things feel like they take a while to implement, um, but you and I have talked about this before. Some of them are like, sometimes when you do them fairly quickly, there's actually some momentum and there's some energy and you get buy-in from like your board or your other colleagues. And like, so even though they feel like they take a long time, they can be done uh, all together and like swiftly. And sometimes that's a little bit easier to do like a lot of change at once. Um, the change to the living wage um, came from, uh, we had started paying a, a $4 an hour pandemic pay top up for anyone who was unable to work from home. So if, if your job required you to go into like, we have a food distribution warehouse and an office, then we were going to pay an extra $4 an hour. And we paid, we had, we were paying that for like the duration of the <laughs> pandemic. I think we were a year into it when at the senior leadership team level, we said, we need to come up with some criteria. When do we end this? Like, do we end this when the province says there's no more emergency order? Do we end this? Like, what's our criteria? Um, and that's at that table where we were like, what if we just never end it? <laughs> and that's what prompted the like, if we've been able to pay it this whole time, um, and if we are valuing this work, and if we're taking a position of um, making sure that we are being equitable and just in, and as much as we can as an employer, uh, what if we just keep it? And so that's what that's what prompted the the shift cool. to like a living wage employer. So uh, there are some things where you know you make one change and then a year later you realize you have the capacity to make more change. Um, and we're we're always not afraid <laughs> to make another change quickly if we have the capacity to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really feeling what you're saying about the speed of change. I think so. In, in our shop, it really most of this happened over. A period of probably about six months and that concentration was helpful in some ways yeah. so we we went out because we'd been going to an external partner for a salary review anyways to kind of get a sense of what was going on in, in the sector and and yeah. how our things stacked up and that was the foundation we were able to to take what they gave us tweak it with a, this kind of equity mindset um so again like i think we brought up the bottom bands from from where the the recommendations landed and that that kind of lit the lit the this that sparked this whole process. Um, yeah. And it was it was definitely easier to do it fast because uh, we just delivered a kind of it was basically just a package of things. This is our new HR policy. These are all these things. 
and it was all, uh, you know, was able to come to the board in one chunk as a, and as a kind of coherent story. Uh, and I actually think it was kind of easier to do it that way than it would have been to spread it over, uh, over a longer period, right? Uh, and that was something I hadn't really anticipated, but, uh, but in the end, it was just like, okay, that's done. This is our new reality. And it, it was that certainty was helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And also, as soon as you make one change, you're going to think of like eight more changes totally. <laughs> you should make. And once you start asking yourself these questions, and once you start having these conversations with staff and different, different teams that are within your organization, um, you're going to get feedback and you're going to get like other points of required change being brought to your attention. And that is good. That is great. Anytime that someone is telling you something that needs to be made better, like we love to say thank you for that feedback. <laughs> um, and the important thing is to take it seriously and to wrestle with it and to figure out how you can implement that change. So you you will, as you start to do these things, uh, unravel <laughs> many more um, things that you want to do in terms of, you know, how does your hiring work? What's your onboarding like? What is your, um, you know, professional development and like performance review systems like, and how do those support people and what changes might you need to make um, if you're using an equity lens? So once you start, you'll just you'll just keep finding more spots. <laughs> totally, and that's exactly what we've been experiencing. I think like the the internal the sort of salary structure changes. The next step mm -hmm. uh, that really moved right into this conversation. Exactly what you're saying about hiring and onboarding, right? And, and yeah, because uh, then there was a bit of a disconnect. If you have this progressive kind of structure internally, but you're still hiring in the old way, and and you know, um, again, getting some of these things done was was kind of easier than you'd think. You know, we so we don't. Uh, generally put degree requirements anymore on our job postings uh, and that was one thing that came right out of these conversations that like there are people coming up who have a really different path but would be yeah. great employees and we're being turned away or we yeah. never used to put salaries on our jobs postings right and now this is like uh you know a big public issue including you know you folks are pushing for that with but charity village which is a big partner in our sector but yeah. for us too like we hadn't always done that in the past and so yeah, it really, I think, sparked that conversation and, and, and around, we've been really changing over our performance review system because it felt funny to have a really, uh, a bit more of an, we did have a kind of old school system, which didn't make sense once we brought in this different way of structuring our salaries, right? And, and yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I, I think you're right. Like once you open the door, it's, it's been really interesting to see what, what comes of it. Um, and yeah, I'm curious, maybe, we'll, maybe that's kind of the last question I had for you is like, what do you think the next steps are for, for an organization like ours? Like, where should we be looking to, uh, with an equity lens on, on how we run our own affairs or how we run our shop? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you the types of things we're working on. And it's hard because I think each one of these things is going to be so specific to your, your local context, your staff team, the area of work that you're doing. Um, some of the things that we're doing right now is, uh, you know, we've changed a lot around hiring and recruitment um, with the purpose of getting more Black folks, Indigenous folks, racialized people, people with lived experience with food insecurity into leadership positions within the organization. And what we're looking at is how does, does the culture of our organization and our management structure actually support people um, mm -hmm. once they're in their roles? Or are people left to navigate that themselves and based on their own life experience or networks that they have, <laughs> Um, there's varying degrees of success, right? How can we actually create a system and structure so that everyone, once they get into a position, has the supports they need? So um, a couple of things we're doing is um, uh, organizing some trainings that are specifically for racialized staff on our team um, to acknowledge that uh, those folks are less represented in management across the board. Um, if you're looking sort of like statistically, um, less access to post-secondary education, less access to training. For us, um, one of the key areas is media training. Uh, mm -hmm. We're constantly asking folks to be able to speak about their work. Um, those folks are also underrepresented in media. So um, organizing some trainings as sort of a, um, uh, like equity framework, but like a positive, <laughs> um, being able to say that, I keep trying to think of the word, but essentially saying um, that those trainings are made available for those folks as an equity initiative. Um, right. The other things that we have 
at the moment that we're really trying to create an action plan around our next sort of organizational action plan is around disability justice. Um, mm -hmm. And what are the ways that from as an employer, um, as an organization that runs programs, what are the ways that we're actually, what does accessibility really mean? Um, and are we just doing kind of the surface level legal requirements, um, which many places don't even sort of meet those standards, but then what does it mean to be deeply accessible? Um, so that's kind of the conversation, some of the conversations that we're having. Um, yeah, what are some things that you're thinking about at your organization? I think a lot of those resonate. Um in terms of like what is what are these kind of internal cultural uh, structural pieces that aren't necessarily written down in policy in, in as formal of a way i think yeah. that's um i'm certainly feeling the the accessibility conversation um i'm in our office today there's no elevator here right mm -hmm. uh and so like that's that's a real issue and i think that's something that will change soon but uh, even some of the basics around uh, like the accessibility in that way, in that kind of deep accessible way, there's a lot to, for us to, to think about. I think we think also about um, generational and like age diversity on our team. Um, mm -hmm. So our team is fairly flat generationally. Almost most of us are, are pretty close in age to each other. And like, what can we do to make sure that like our way of working is open to people with different uh life paths and life experiences um because it's kind of easy to settle into a certain way of doing things that makes sense because we're all uh kind of millennial ish uh, but that's i think something to that we want to be more conscious of and um and similarly in, in terms of our leadership structure you know how do we how do we make that kind of space exactly right like how and how do how do folks feel supported you know like i'm conscious we replicate a, a pretty common dynamic in our sector which is that our workforce is generally folks who identify as women, except for me, uh, the like the leadership yeah. level or the, like the yeah. highest level leadership person. That's a really common structure, but that doesn't mean it's a good one. And so thinking about what does it do to distribute leadership as widely as we can. And, and I think you're right, media training is actually a surprisingly important part of that, even in terms of making sure that, because um, the, the real work uh, in many ways of, of, of our shop gets done by this big team of people and making sure that they're in a space where they can be the face of it is, mm -hmm. is important, totally. Yeah, that's, a, I think, a lot of the same things that, that we're thinking of. And I'm sure we'll be coming back to some of these kind of on policy things. It, you know, we may be running, this is our first year through, we'll probably run into places where things don't make sense or, or we yeah. accidentally created a sticky spot or a trap for ourselves. And so like, keeping an eye on, on those things. Um, but also I think like conversations like this and maybe I'll close with that because like that's my last thought on this is that we've been kind of shy to talk about this stuff to be honest with you. Um, and it feels, it always feels a little bit strange and exposed to talk about your mm -hmm. HR process or you know how you manage your team. And um, because like, obviously we haven't been doing things uh, you know, this way for that long, uh, you know? And, and so um, I think the other thing is for us is to kind of um, take a breath and, and reach out a little bit more on this stuff to our colleagues and see if we can be a, be a support to other people if they're thinking yeah. about these kind of changes is like that's a that's a definite um, way of thinking that's that's coming up to me after after this chat too. Yeah, I think like I'm thinking about two things. One is um, kind of to finish is I, I saw a job posting from the I think it was the McConnell Foundation the other day where they said at the bottom under compensation, we believe in pay transparency, but we're not ready yet because we're doing some internal work around how we actually pay people. And how, and so that to me, I'm like, that's better than saying nothing. <laughs> and totally. it's a signal that at least people are starting to do some of that internal work. And, and the more people talk about, um, how it is challenging, but in some ways, but it's also quite easy to, to implement these changes. They're good changes that your staff are going to like. <laughs> um, and also we have seen an increase in our monthly donors. We've seen an increase in people who have said, oh, this is an organization that I wanna support because they are actually implementing the types of things that they want to see government doing and policymakers doing. So it is a po it's a very positive move, even though people are often sort of like afraid <laughs> to have that sort of internal work. And the, the, the other thing I will say is there was a, a study that was done in Ontario around management and nonprofits, and they looked kind of at demographics and a survey around what people were doing around, you know, diversifying the sector. And I mean, it came, it came out as you would expect, 
management and nonprofits is largely white folks. It's largely women. It's largely like a certain age bracket. But one of the questions they were asked was, um, like, what is your organization doing to get more diversity within your organization or to like address some of this stuff? And it was like a small percentage said actively making changes. A small percentage said nothing. And then it was like 80% said neutral. And you're like, what's neutral? <laughs> neutral is nothing. What is right? neutral? Yeah, yeah. you're either doing something or you're supporting the way that it currently is. So I think we need more people to move themselves. <laughs> if you're in a position of leadership within an organization, um, if you have influence on leaders within the organization, we need more people to identify themselves as the, I am doing something. I am actively doing something around recruitment, around you know hiring practices, around the culture of your organization. Um, we need to see people like <laughs> shift from neutral because if you're neutral and you're just waiting for it to change, it's not gonna change and it's most likely gonna get worse. So we need more people in that I'm actively doing something column. So I think it's good that you're talking about it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a special responsibility for some of us who have a bit more flexibility than others, right? Like uh, some food right. systems organizations like ours, um, where we have a whole basket of different funders, it's actually a little bit easier to bring these kind of changes in. Totally. If you're delivering kind of a sole source contract on behalf of government, where they're, they're paying a lot of attention to individual salary bands, it can be, this is, can be much trickier. But I'll say this has been quite easy for us. You know, uh, no one is uh, no one is looking. Uh, well, now I'm going to curse myself. But <laughs> no one looks at our grant applications and says, "Why is that a, a fifty thousand dollar position? It should be 30. You know, that's not the type yeah. of scrutiny you generally get. Um, you know, people are often actually quite pleased to see that we're paying people in an adequate way. Uh, yeah. And so, like, yeah, I think you know, if you can do it. Um, I agree. I think it's important that we do because there are, for some folks, the conversation can be longer or harder or involve more like systemic change from the funder end. And, and for those of us who can do it, I think that, that gives us even like less of an excuse not to, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, thanks for kicking this around with, with me today, Katie. I think and, sure. and thanks for all your team has done to inspire this work for us. It's been really nice to have uh, to have your leadership uh, kind of to, to hang some ideas on as, as we go through this. Well, that's great. I think it's it takes a lot of collaboration and people talking to each other about what's working in their organization and to know that you don't re have to reinvent anything. There are people <laughs> throughout our sector that are are asking the same questions as that, you know, if you have questions, odds are there's other people in your sector who have those same questions or have maybe taken some action. So if you're looking to, at making some of these changes, like reach out to Josh, reach out to FoodShare and, and see if maybe there's some policy ideas, you know, HR policy type things that we can share that you don't have to start from scratch um, for sure. So it was great to talk to you. Totally. Thanks. <laughs> great.